Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Welcome to the, our oversight hearing on the city's Commission on Gender Equity. Today we will discuss That's right, hey there. Today we will discuss the city's work to empower New Yorkers that have been historically marginalized. Women, girls, transgender, gender nonconforming, and intersex individuals. With an intersectional lens, the committee is interested in the interplay of power structures that exacerbate and perpetuate gender disparities, especially with regard to age, sexual orientation, race, and employment status. Nearly a year into the current legislative session, this committee has examined several fundamental challenges of gender equity and justice, including gender-based harassment and discrimination in the workplace, inadequacies in the way the NYPD's Special Victims Division is addressing sexual assault, unacceptably high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity, particularly among black women, failures in preventing sexual abuse in city jails, restrictions on reproductive choices, and the persistence of domestic and gender-based violence. That's not where I thought we'd be in 2018 but we're moving forward. Through legislation, the council has made strides toward progress from passing anti-sexual harassment in the workplace laws to increasing access to doulas for pregnant people and lactation spaces for new mothers. More recently, the council passed groundbreaking victim-centric legislation to make sure detectives and police officers have the tools necessary to make victims of sexual assault feel heard and safe. While these are significant accomplishments, critical challenges remain, including resources necessary to make sure that the NYPD can do its job well. The Commission on Gender Equity plays an essential role in facing those challenges. After thoughtful consideration, the commission established three primary areas on which to focus, economic mobility, safety, and health and reproductive justice. The commission's agenda on these areas is rightfully ambitious. We will soon hear about CGE's recently announced strategic plan to carry out its mission and advance the city toward greater equity in these areas. We will also hear from stakeholders and service providers in the field advancing gender equity every day. My hope for this hearing is that we will gain a greater understanding of the current landscape of gender-based initiatives that are being undertaken across the city. To achieve this, we will discuss the work of gender equity liaisons that currently exist in five agencies, as well as the newly launched New York City Gender Equity Interagency Partnership with 57 agencies. We will review what indicators will help us know where the city is succeeding in its efforts to increase gender equity and the gaps that remain. Our work is not complete as long as trans individuals lack access to adequate and appropriate health care, as long as female identifying or presenting students are not afforded equal access to STEM opportunities, as long as equal work does not result in equal pay, as long as women justifiably fear harassment and assault while riding our subway system, after working the night shift, as long as sexual assault survivors are received in substandard, under-resourced facilities or told there aren't enough resources to meet with them, as long as these and other barriers to gender equity persist, 
we must also persist in breaking them down. Our work is taking place in a moment of tremendous cultural and social upheaval. To achieve success requires leadership that can respond to the movement and see how it fits in the long arc towards justice. Success requires creative collaboration across sectors and intersections of identities to arrive at holistic solutions that lift all boats. The city is fortunate that such leadership and collaboration exists in the Commission on Gender Equity. Executive Director Jacqueline Ebanks and her team carry out their mandate to address issues of inequity and discrimination facing girls, women, and transgender and gender non-conforming individuals with enthusiasm and pride. Before we hear from Executive Director Ebanks, I'd like to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well as committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, Council, Chloe Rivera, Legislative Policy Analyst, Dan Krupp, Financial Analyst, and Monica uh, People, our brand new Financial Analyst. I want to acknowledge um, Brad Lander from Brooklyn, who's on our committee and who is present. And um, I also want to recognize my general counsel on not only passing the bar, but uh, successfully being accepted into the New York City, New York State Bar. And we really appreciate everything that you're doing. Congratulations. Uh, and with that, she will swear you in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Rosenthal, and good morning, Councilmember Lander. Thank you so much for your opening and inspirational remarks, uh, uh, Chair Rosenthal. As you said, I'm Jacqueline Ebanks. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity, and in this capacity, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues impacting gender equity in New York City. Thank you for this opportunity to update you on the activities of the Commission since its creation in 2015. As you know, the Council codified this Commission into law in 2016, and the Commission is required to do a few things. One is to study the nature and extent of inequities facing women and girls in the city. Two, to study the impact of these inequities on the economic, civic, and social well-being of women and girls. Also, the Commission is asked to advise on ways to analyze the function and commission of city composition of city agencies through a gender-based lens and recommend ways to develop equitable recruitment strategies. We are also required to make recommendations to the Mayor and to the Council for the reduction of gender-based inequalities. As a part of our requirements, we submit an annual report to the Mayor and City Council and we meet at least once every four months with one of our meetings open to the public. I am pleased to report that the Commission is now carrying out its responsibilities guided by its recently released 2018 through 2021 strategic plan. A copy of this strategic plan is provided for you along with this testimony. The plan presents the goals and strategies that we hope to deploy in order to advance gender equity within three focus areas, economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. I want to take a few moments now to go through the goals and the strategies in each of the focus areas, and to note that our goals are goals that span the entire duration of the strategic plan 
as well as the strategies. So there are four-year goals and uh, four-year strategies. In our first focus area, economic mobility and opportunity, the goal is to create a city where people of all gender identities and gender expressions live economically secure lives and have opportunities to thrive. Our strategies for achieving this goal are one, closing the gender leadership gap in all sectors and at all levels. Two, closing the gender pay gap for all workers in all sectors. And three, defining and closing the gender asset and wealth gaps. Our second uh, focus area is health and reproductive justice. In this area, we have a goal of creating a city free from gender and race-based health disparities. And our strategies are, one, to ensure, ensure access and affordability of comprehensive, culturally competent, reproductive health care services, again, for New Yorkers, regardless of their gender identity or gender expression. Two, we also seek to ensure access to and affordability of comprehensive, culturally competent medical care for all New Yorkers. And finally, we'd like to increase access to sexual health education for New York City youth. In our third and final focus area, safety, our goal is a New York City free from gender and race-based violence, and our strategies are, one, ensuring short and long-term safety and stability for key populations, domestic violence survivors, transgender and gender nonconforming people, and people in the LGBTQ community. Secondly, we want a city where we can ensure safe environments for persons of all gender identities and gender expressions in public and private spaces. And third, and critically important, we would like to be able to end human trafficking, whether it starts in New York City, passes through New York City, or ends in New York City. Wherever we find it, we want to be able to eliminate it. To successfully carry out this plan, CG, CGE operates within three guiding principles. First, we recognize the diversity of gender. Second, we use an intersectional lens. This means that the Commission's populations are, of focus, are girls, women, transgender, and gender nonconforming individuals, regardless of ability, age, ethnicity or race, faith, gender expression, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. And finally, the city leads by example. We want to be a city that leads in the development and implementation of best practices uh, for gender equitable policies and programs for our workforce and for our residents. As you mentioned, the culmination of the Commission's strategic plan is the creation of the New York City Gender Equity Interagency Partnership, which held its kickoff meeting on November 13. The interagency partnership is comprised of senior level representatives from across all city agencies who will work together to develop, advocate for, and implement an integrated and sustainable approach to achieving gender equity in New York City. This partnership, and this approach will ensure that the Commission's work goes beyond the creation of singular initiatives or programs towards building broader systemic and culture change. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to share the Commission's progress and plans, and we look forward to working with the City Council to continuing to advance gender equity in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna ask a couple quick overview questions and then I'll, I know my colleague has some questions as well. Um, could you uh, describe the, the staffing you have and the area in the budget where your staffing lines show up? Um, so the staffing we have uh, is a total of five full-time staff as of December 31st, uh, we are in the process of hiring two. We actually have two full, three full-time staff on board, 
pleased to uh, indicate that our senior director for policy and programs, Chancey Powell, is in the room today. And we have our special assistant and myself. So these are the three on board. We have interviewed and hired um, our senior director for communications and outreach and a policy and program analyst. Uh, the, we are supported, thankfully, with five undergraduate and graduate interns, one of whom is able to be here today, Carson Fisher. Mm -hmm. And um, this is her first hearing. And uh, so that the staff is being built out and uh, the city funding, total city funding, is just under 600K for, for this work. Okay, I, your last sentence was what I was looking for. Um, the enactment of Local Law 67 of 2016 indicated two staffers. Right. Um, has that 600,000 been baselined in the city's budget? The 600, uh, let me say it this way, the current staffing structure was built based on the strategic plan. So, and the strategic plan was just completed um, this year. So we're in a process, I think, of beginning the baselining because we're in the mid middle of a term uh, of a fiscal year. I, I think what we wanted to be sure about is that we were conscious in building this staff out and that we had uh, rationale for increasing our team. So at this point, um, you know, this becomes our new budget. And uh, when the new fiscal year starts, I think that's the point at which we talk about baselining it. So you're saying that you're not, you have not been given an assurance that the staffing model that you've established so thoughtfully will be funded in the next I fiscal year? I expect that it will be. To be completely transparent, I expect that it will be. I don't expect that um, we will see any reduction in staff. In the November plan, the mayor actually makes any modifications that he thinks will uh, be necessary to the budget. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that additional uh, $400,000 is included in the November modification? Yes, it is. Oh. That it is. So very good. Congratulations. Can you please uh, send over that, those details? Sure, we will. Great. Thank you very much. Um, could you talk about your working relationship with the um, commissioners and what I'm getting at here, because I am a commissioner, so I don't, uh, I'm not starting from zero here, but where uh, the, the question I'm really trying to get at is, uh, is there a, um, sort of binding pledge that the work that you come up with, the findings, your findings, will be implemented? From the CGE commissioners, when you refer to commissioners? Yeah, only because that's your tie mm -hmm. to city government is the membership. Right, right. So, so um, the strategic plan was developed with the city, with the commissioners at the table, the, the CGE commissioners, so the, the 32 member panel. And uh, as you know, we had several sessions and uh, came to the, this plan. So I do know that we have solid buy-in from all our CGE commissioners, commissioners uh, to, the, to the plan, including the new ones that we just appointed, uh, that were just appointed by the mayor and the speaker of the council as the plan was discussed with them before uh, the opportunity was offered. Um, and I also know that throughout city government, this, the commissioners of agencies are in full support of, of this plan and this work. Yes. Full support means that, well here, let's use an exa sure. exact example the gender liaisons. Maybe mm -hmm. you could start by talking about their role, and I know there are five who yes. have been budgeted. What is your sense about um, possibility or thoughts about uh, funding gender liaisons at, gender equity liaisons at more of the 
departments. So as you know, the, the Gender Equity Liaison position was established through the City Council's uh, Young Women's Initiative, Leadership Initiative. And um, they're in five city agencies. I'll just repeat uh, for the record, Department of Education, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Department of Social Services, and Department of Youth and Community Development. Uh, since 2007, I'm sorry, since July 2017, CGE has been working with the gender equity liaisons to develop a process to integrate gender equity as a framework into the work of city agencies. This work has informed the creation of the Gender Equity Interagency Partnership. What we, we at, and as I mentioned, we held our kickoff meeting on November 13th. So what we are learning from the gender equity liaisons, we are beginning to uh, extend to city agencies and uh, senior level individuals, chiefs of staff, assistant commissioners, deputy commissioners have been appointed by commissioners of 57 agencies to be on this interagency task force uh, partnership group. So that work is in, in play, at play, and we're looking organically at a structure that can work across city agencies to advance gender equity in the city. You, you mentioned the term gender equity partnership, mm -hmm. and it was a meeting in November of last year, and it was held at the Board of Trustees of the Gender Equity Liaison Coordinator. And it's very exciting that the meeting that we will have hopefully this year yes. will be There's absolutely room, and we are in the process of shaping out a, lead, a youth leadership council. The first lady has always been concerned that our uh, commission does not include a youth voice, and so we're building a youth leadership council that will work with the same elements of the strategic plan to look at how these areas impact young women, young girls, transgender, and gender nonconforming youth. If that and based on that, we're hoping also to pull into the mix the work of the Young Women's Initiative. Yeah, so that's if that yeah. is the area that they serve, that might be what the group exactly. Is. Yeah, that's a lot of work for them to try to study. Yeah, yes, we know. And I, when I was in the advocacy world, I was on one of the working groups. Uh, we are in con in conversation with uh, Girls for Gender Equity, which is a leading partner of that effort. What we see this work, our s what I call probably Young Women's Initiative 2.0, is how do we build on the progress and success of the first effort to create a deeper citywide investment. I think that has to include not only the efforts of Young Women's Initiative, but the work of the Commission on Gender Equity so that we build a space for the youth voice that it's okay. solidly integrated. So yeah. um, the point that you're trying to make is it's part of this. Yes. And it's still 2.0 work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it is still a huge push and I guess the fact that you're doing it after you do every single one of them. Um, and I'm just wondering how that goes with the staff. Are you bringing yeah, and so we will bring that to the table as we build out this initiative. So what, what I'm actually saying, it's not in isolation, that we'll be doing both and, and you're absolutely right, we have to build on the work and the progress made before, and that's our intent. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, 
Director Ebanks, for this good testimony and for all your work. I guess I have a couple of questions about the relationship of this work to other things going on in the administration. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is, I know, uh, established by council law last term also and in partnership with City Hall, there are several agencies, three to begin with, undergoing these equity audits, right. um, which is an exciting new process and tool and is getting underway. And I just wonder if you could talk a little about how y you and your team are related to that auditing, equity auditing yeah. work, which is not exclusively about gender equity, there's uh, race Racial, and other right. categories as well, but gender equity is certainly a critical and central lens. I think that work is starting at HRA, at DOHMH, and at ACS. ACS, DSS, and DOHMH, yes. Yeah. Um, so I started August 2017, and I had the great pleasure of sitting next to the mayor when he signed the, those bills into law. Um, the, the work has begun. I was a part of initial discussions with um, and in partnership with the mayor's office of operations. The agencies have been developing those plans, uh, those assessments, they've conducted them, and I'm looking here, I see that. We expect that a report will be available come July 2019, but the work has been ongoing and guided by and supported by the mayor's office of operations, and so we expect reporting out. So staff from the Mayor's Office of Operations are the ones who have res lead responsibility for, or the agency the staff with support? Who, the, yeah. The agency well, staff with support. Staff from each of those agencies get consulting and support and assistance from the Mayor's of Office Operations, but the report is being done by so their staff. Yes. And will come in the form of three separate reports, each report issued by the agency itself? We are not yet clear on what that reporting will be like. One of the things we want to make sure is that we give the uh, autonomy, if you will, of each agency to work in their unique construct and space. And so I think that has been assured while um, you know, going towards equity assessments. And so that uh, the uniqueness of each space, each agency is better able to, to manage uh, that work, and then supported by uh, the mayor's office of operation. Okay, so that sounds to me like maybe an equity self-assessment. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Okay, but like when I, you know, when employees do their annual performance reviews, like usually you have them do a self-review and then also someone else reviews them. But it's not, so what's happening yes. here is we are supporting, and I haven't looked at Local Law 174 of whichever year it was in a little while, but it sounds like what has evolved, and I guess I understood it, I, I have in my head kind of from the work that Gare and others have done something that you would call like an equity audit. Right. Where... Uh, external actor, obviously in partnership with the agency, kind of audits or assesses, but instead, and I can see the benefits of having people internally internalize those tools and use them, but you can also imagine the ways in which self-assessment sometimes has weaknesses r compared to external assessment. And I think you, you make an excellent point. Um, I, I, as this, I would say, is our first foray into this work. We wanted to ensure that the that the agencies had opportunity, guided by consultants, to understand the process and to and and quite frankly, they work with this data on a regular basis. Um, the The process has always involved ongoing touch point meetings, so that. It, and I'm aware of this, although I have not been able to be a part of them, I do think there is oversight and full, I expect full transparency in this process. All right. And that, I guess that bill, which I'm looking at now, also requires the creation of an equity committee to, uh, to review the reports. Is that, are you, you know, can, do you, has that committee been stood up, and what is it? Not, not at this time, but, but I do know that I will be a member of such a committee. Okay. Uh, so there, there will be, when the agencies complete their self-assessments, which you anticipate will be in June, yeah. they will be submitted to, I mean, I assume the council will get them, but they will also go to this committee, which hasn't yet been stood up, although since the reports aren't ready yet, it's got right, a couple right. of months. 
and you'll be a member of it to review those annual reports? Absolutely, yes. Okay, and, and I guess this might not be a fair question since it hasn't been stood up yet, but you know, obviously what would be very valuable is if that committee um, did more than say thank you for these reports, but uh, you know, uh, did something with them, we like ref yes. And I fully agree with you, and I, I do expect that that would be our approach. Okay, and the hope is that in addition to reviewing the reports, making sure that they're thorough, that the action plans are real, and that the agencies follow up on their action plans, also that we reflect as a city more broadly on a plan, presumably for having all agencies over time go through such a process. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. All right, well, okay, so that's a helpful set of reminders, and uh, Madam Chair, it sounds like we'll have some good work to do when those reports come in to review the reports themselves, but also to speak with this committee and think about what the process is for, for moving forward more yes. broadly to yes. make that a, a, and, a you know, standardized process. As I ended my process. remarks, uh, council member, the goal is broad systemic and culture change. And those equity assessments and equity plans are key to making that happen. Yeah, so I, we, I, we want to make sure that this is not something that's being treated lightly. Yeah. And we also want to make sure that we have a participatory approach to this work. And I think it's a really interesting question that I look forward to doing some more drilling down on because I, I think two things are both true and they're in some tension with each mm -hmm. other. The work of getting the agencies to internalize, embrace, and uh, this work is critical. Yes. As opposed to them thinking like external auditors come okay. in. Right. Um, so that's true, and I think it's valuable. It's also true that like, if the approach we took to MWBE compliance was agency self-assessment, we would be woefully, that would be a woefully inadequate approach to achieving compliance with an equity set of equity goals. Right, so right. what the right balance is between supporting and encouraging internal compliance and self uh, reflect, you know, reflective behavior and, and self-improvement and external something that's more like an audit on which someone is holding you to goals and not just those that you Absolutely. said, well, we're gonna do better here, no, and is I, I agree also valuable. You. And I think we're gonna have some things to learn. Absolutely. So that um, that sounds like a valuable set of uh, uh, processes that will come out after Agreed. the first reports are in Agreed. in June. And I look yeah. forward, you know, I guess we'll want to include probably the, the Civil Rights Committee since those are racial and gender equity audits, but that sounds like some, some very valuable hearings to get to do uh, in 2019. Um, there's yes, now several other you. members here, so even though I had a couple other questions I was gonna ask, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave my questioning uh, at this and hand it off to colleagues and look forward yeah. to working with you yeah. on that process in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much, Council Member Lander. We've been joined by Council Members Kalos and Ayala. I know they both have questions, but I'm, I'm just gonna come back to one very quickly um, about the budget. We went back and checked and actually there is no funding for additional staff in the November uh, modification. Um, okay. There mm -hmm. is uh, $70,000 in the OTPS line, but no adjustment for PS um, at all. So I- So uh, we'll, we'll follow up. Okay, well, I mean, so far we're not. And so either you're gonna send over a new November preliminary, which will include the staffing, or you're gonna say to the public that it may or may not be in the yeah. preliminary budget. That's a little disconcerting. Um, similarly disconcerting is the question of the uh, gender equity liaisons where um, as part of our budget negotiations and adoption, there was an agreement that those positions in the agencies would be baselined, and yet in the adopted budget, those lines were not reflected, nor are they in the preliminary uh, budget baseline. So I'm uh, very I concerned that uh, you are, that the administration may very well be asking agencies to self-fund these positions, uh, which if that's true, that should be made public that that's what you're asking agencies to do. 
um, then I would ask what are the positions that are not being filled in order to fill the gender equity liaisons um, that is concerning to me. Um, I'm going to leave to, sorry? Oh, I'm going to leave to Councilmember Ayala questions about um, NGBV, because um, I'm going to assume that she's asking those questions. But I want to ask a little bit more about working with other uh, parts of government. Um, I'm wondering about uh, how uh, the commission interacts with the deputy mayor, uh, deputy mayor Glenn, who started women.nyc. Um, and there's this wonderful, um, I think, uh, I think this is in women.nyc. She build NYC? Yeah, that's a part of that. It may be a different part. There may be two no, separate things, um, but She Build NYC has to do with monuments, um, and I'm wondering um, whether or not the commission had any connection to those initiatives. Um, you know, uh, one could definitely see that both those things are part of women's empowerment. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, Thank you. I would, uh, we, we are, one of the tensions we have when we look at the work of the commission is when are we an operational vehicle and when is the commission this 30,000 foot oversight ensuring that the city builds an infrastructure of gender equity? equitable practices and policies. And so within that tension, very often, there are things we realize that it's best for a deputy mayor or an agency to develop and implement, but then we ought to be able to connecting to it that the C CGE then amplifies that work as a part of the broader work that New York City does. So that was l those efforts were led and are managed within the deputy mayor's uh, portfolio women.nyc and she build as uh, she build is is out of uh, department of cultural affairs i think yeah. and um and um women.nyc is out of uh, i forget the economic economic development corporation so it, it what then we want to happen, especially through the gender equity interagency partnership, is for us to begin to capture this all this, you know, this myriad work happening and be able to use through CGE an amplifying voice to say this is how New York City is addressing issues of gender equity, whether they impact women, girls, transgender, or gender nonconforming individuals. Uh, we are not going to be an operational entity, but sometimes we can be. So, you know, we have launched the 16 days of activism and uh, campaign, which we're entering November 25th through December 10th. That's been something spearheaded by the Commission on Gender Equity. We've pulled together city agencies and community-based agencies to do this. But I will tell you with the expanded role of the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, we're already in discussions in t for 2019 that this campaign gets managed through the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. So I, I think, uh, and so we're supportive of those efforts and we'll continue to use our platforms to amplify the work. That'd be great. I mean, one way to do that is to have the information on your website. Absolutely. Um, I just didn't see it's, any it's links. It's not there at this time. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's see. Real quickly, I just want to ask about your work on data collection and to try to understand whether or not you're collecting data specifically related to non-binary individuals. Um, and I'm referring to your testimony where you mention ensuring access to affordability and affordability of comprehensive, culturally competent medical care mm -hmm. um, for New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity or gender expression. Is that anything that you are collecting or plan to collect data around? We, um, 
I'll just take a step back. As we did the, the strategic plan, we recognized a dearth of information for transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. And so we will be looking at mechanisms to begin to collect that data. Um, again, probably through city agencies. The Unity Project is a key partner in this work, and they are will be helping and uh, doing work in, in this space as well. I literally just missed your last sentence. The which agency? The Unity Project. For the Unity Project that focuses on LGBTQ youth. Okay. That's a key partner in, in our work, and so we'll be using working with them to really build out this approach around data collection. But I'm seeing this work. The question is, what's already being collected in agencies? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, it, the goal is not to duplicate, yeah. uh, as you would expect. The goal is to synthesize and to you know, share the information, again, using CGE as a centralizing hub for the work that's happening in agencies and to really say to the city of New York, this is what's happening, this is how you're represented regardless of gender identity or gender expression, and this is how you're served. Thank you. Would you consider reaching out to uh, Health and Hospitals Absolutely. Corporation or Department of Health? You hadn't mentioned Absolute, that. No, uh, even though I didn't, but That's all okay. city agencies, Do you yes. know if they collect that data? I don't know at this point. I would, my assumption is they do for more reasons than one. Okay. My, my interaction They're having with a them. hearing, I think, uh, related to this issue next week. And um, so perhaps that information about whether or not the data is collected, what data you have, could be presented at that hearing. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Council Member, um, who's ready? Council Member Kalos. Uh, thank you to uh, Chair Helen Rosenthal and her leadership on women's issues even before she took on this committee. Uh, it is good to have a, another man join me on the women's committee, and uh, we will continue to do our best uh, as allies. As we talk about gender equity, well, well first, it's good to see you. Uh, you. I want to thank you for all the great work you did at the Women's City Club, particularly thank our work you, together on... Uh, campaign finance. Thank you. Uh, what you. What'd you think of ballot question one now <laughs> a, after the fact? It passed, right? <laughs> uh, more people voted on ballot question one than uh, voted for mayor in 2017 in favor. It and was a uh, banner year for <laughs> turnout. So congratulations, <laughs> council members. No, thank you for all the great work you've done before and now what you're doing in this uh, commission. I guess one issue, I guess question I have about equity is belief. I, 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 I have a newborn. Uh, I hope I can still say it. She's nine months old, and so I, I took paternity leave, and I actually got criticized for it uh, because it, it turns out that I do not lactate. I, I was not uh, breastfeeding, uh, though I was feeding my daughter what had been breastfed and, and expressed, as it were. Uh, and as I've spoken to other men, um, it varies between people who work in places that have a culture that, um, and, and, and even, I would, I would even just say beyond just men, but people who are in relationships where they are not the child-bearing partner. Uh, what, and so some people are in environments where everyone takes family leave Mm -hmm. And some people are in environments where it's only socially acceptable for folks to take maternity leave. Is family leave an important issue for gender equity? And is it important that regardless of gender that uh, where there is a family unit with two parents that we, that we are focused on ensuring that actually all parents are involved in family leave? Absolutely. I mean, I, and I've, I just say yes to that. You know, what I do want to add that um, the work we try to do, and you, you said this, is not just about policies and practices. It's about the culture. And so we have heard, and it's been reported, that many for-profit companies have paternity leave, leave, but they have to encourage, and if not urge, the, the men to take it because of the stigma. So we're at a period in time where we have 
fairly strong, uh, we have strong family leave policies in the state and in the city, and that we need to ensure that parents who take it and parents, whether it be maternity or paternity leave, are encouraged to do so and supported to do so. So um, I think that's a critical piece of work, and I just want to also mention that earlier this year we passed the uh, diaper changing station bill which also extends to, and that in every new building, we in the city, we now have to have a diaper changing station in every single restroom. I think that's mm -hmm. also a very mm -hmm. important move to this cultural shift where we normalize the non-birthing uh, parent, if you will, as having an active role in uh, raising children. And so it's a critical piece of gender equity. It affects how women access the workforce as well. And um, it really affects women's earnings, when, and unfortunately that's sort of the bulk of the data we have now. We know that women take a lot of time out of the workforce for caregiving, whether it's for a newborn, or adopted infant, or a, a caring parent. So it's really wonderful that we're creating ways to have both parents share equally in, in this role, so. And, and just on the focus of uh, the economy and, and jobs, uh, I think one of the other pieces that our chair was discussing was the she built NYC. I, 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 as a person with a tech background, I'm focused on women.nyc. So now that we've passed uh, somewhat landmark legislation about not having folks disclose what their prior pay rate is, the other issue is making sure that we provide access to high paying jobs. Uh, particularly for women so that they can get past these previous inequities. And Absolutely. I would argue that these inequities do still continue despite some of our best efforts. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, women.nyc and how folks at home, uh, where more than 50% are likely <laughs> to be women, can take advantage of this resource and what is there and how we are measuring the success of women.nyc? Um, Unfortunately, at this time, I, I don't have that data, and we'll, we'll have to be able to get that, get that to you. Thank you. I look forward to uh, working with you. Thank you. Councilmember Ayala. Good morning. Sorry I was late. Um, I really wanted to have a question. I, I was recently appointed to the commission. I'm really yes. excited. I'm Thank looking you. forward to learning more and, um, and becoming more involved. Um, but my question this morning was really around the commission's relationship with the mayor's office to end domestic violence and gender-based violence, domestic and gender-based um, based violence. And so beyond the 16 days of activism, what, what other type of work or initiatives are, are you jointly you know, working on? We have an incredible relationship with the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. It's a partnership where one of the agencies that we are literally joined at the hip. The commissioner, Cecile Noel, was a part of the development of our strategic plan and an integral player and informed the plan. Um, because of the expanded role of the, the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, we know that the safety portfolio that we have identified in our strategic plan will be shared in vis-a-vis -vis implementation. So we're discussing at the moment what that looks like, what roles we, we play, but we, we work together on the ground and we work together strategically and we work together in the policy space. That's an agency that is a key partner for our work and we a key partner for their work. I love Commissioner Noel, I just want to set on the record, but <coughs> I think I if we could find a way to uh, localize some of those um, policy-related initiatives, that that would be great, because I think oftentimes, you know, through different commissions, the work is really spread across the city and sometimes doesn't really make it to smaller communities. And okay. I, I think we, you know, we, we saw uh, um, a lot of that through like the Young Women's uh, Leadership Initiative, which was great, but a lot of it was really centered around policy and a lot of those ideas were really great and could have been implemented on a community-based uh, uh, model. Uh, the second question that I had was around the, uh, the ending uh, human trafficking um, work and understanding that January is uh, Human Trafficking Month, uh, wondering what the commission if, you know, had in mind uh, to really bring awareness. Um, so 
January Anti-Human Trafficking Month. Uh, what we will be doing is we'll be in partnership with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. As you know, because we're in this 16-day period, it's, that's one of the elements of gender-based violence. So we'll be shining a spotlight now and then building out to an uh, opportunity in January, but we haven't decided what that work will be at this time. I can appreciate that. Please keep us posted. I would love to be able to be helpful. Will do. Thank you. Um, can I go back to correct something for the record? I was just, uh, this was brought. The, the budget, I misspoke, it will show in the January budget, not in November. So I just want to check Ryan. Is this one working? I can't. There's no red light. Are you? Yeah. Is this one working fine? Okay. I'm just going to sort of slide over a little bit here. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, will there be an announcement? Any formal announcement of the money going into the budget? Does how, how will the public know? Uh, it, will there be specific lines put in? Let me just say it a different way. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Okay. Here's, here's how I would say it. Um, you know, with all due respect to the administration, this was an agreement made at adoption. It should have gone in the budget in adoption it's very disheartening that it wasn't put in the first modification, which is the administration's opportunity to say, here are the changes we've made since adoption, and um, this, is, this is what we're doing this year. In other words, it acknowledges the current year, and it's such a de minimis amount of money I just, I, I cannot, um, with all due respect, express more strongly, although I may, um, how deeply disappointing it is that it was not included in November. And um, there's, I, I don't even, I can't wrap my head around it yet. But I'm going to move on. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about um, uh, the work the commission is doing and what the commission thinks are the main issues facing cisgender and transgender women and girls in the city today um, and facing LGBTQ intersex and non gender nonconforming individuals. And the question is, what do we think are the main issues? Yeah. Or where are you focusing, focusing your efforts around? So within the strategic plan, and that, that's the idea of them, um, we have what we consider lead initiatives, okay, which is if efforts that will get underway within this first year. What's key to us is how do we ensure that cisgender, transgender, gender nonconforming individuals are full beneficiaries of the wealth and resources of New York City within the three focus areas? Uh, again, economic mobility and opportunity, health and reproductive justice, and safety. So we, therefore, will be looking at within those areas and within those lead initiatives, where are there moments of opportunity for leadership, and not just in the city, not in the city's workforce, but across all sectors, right? Um, I think that requires for us communication through our city agencies, data collection, um, analysis of that information, and then partnership with domestic nonprofits, international nonprofits, where we get to, and with the for-profit sector, where we get to shape new program initiatives, if necessary, or we get to expand ones that we consider working. So I think um, employment is one space. Clearly, when you think across the age spectrum, we want to think of youth and education and the opportunities that we're opening up so that all avenues of society is open to every individual, regardless of gender or gender, gender identity or expression. I think, you know, the healthcare space with reproductive justice is key. Uh, regret the regrettable divorce ruling 
um, we have to look at our colleges and see what we can do to reinforce the good work we have in New York State and New York City and um, to ensure that we continue the protections that we have for our college students. And the safety space is critical. We know that, unfortunately, as crime has declined in New York City, the one area in which we see increase is around gender-based violence. We need to have um, strategies that are multi-level. And I want to go a bit to the public engagement strategy. For us, what is key is that we are involving the community at every level. And so when we have a public, edu public meeting, as we will in December, it's really how do we get the voice of the commission outside of City Hall? Additionally, how do we get the voices of the people connecting us and informing our work so that we can deliver a product that's uh, more appropriate to the use of, the, of our general public? So I think that's the landscape of our work. That's great. Do you have a component part in your budget for public education? We, yes, and the initiative that we'll be launching is the Gender Equity Summit. So uh, yes, we have resources to apply and, and against that. Okay, and again, I would just want confirmation of that from Within the administration. The Great, um, and you've picked up on my next question, which does have to do with the current president and um, all of his threats to uh, women or uh, uh, the LGBT community, um, gender nonconforming trans. And I'm wondering uh, whether or not the commission plans to, or if somebody else in government mm -hmm. is already addressing the issue of um, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services consideration of establishing a legal definition of sex under Title IX, um, and also regarding the uh, Department of Education's Title IX compliance. We are in discussion across the city and we'll be uh, responding to, to both and creating a res response for both, but we're in discussion at the moment. Do you have a sense of timing on that? So is there anything, anything that the council can do to be <laughs> helpful? Time. I mean, that was something that I issued a statement on the day that the Title IX, the DOE Title IX, I issued and, a statement that day. There's, I have an op-ed in the Daily News about it. Yes, and, and we will be doing that. You know, we've been in communication and via email as well. I, I've just been working on this last night. So it's an active discussion, what, you know, for us, and certainly I, you know, somebody will, I either myself, I am shaping a piece, but what I'm looking for is a sustained response. And I, th I think that's the thing that concerns us, not just wanting to be uh, reactionary to this president and his actions, but how do we look at something that's sustained? And, and that takes a little bit more shaping, which for us clearly is making sure that we protect New York City residents, and as that can extend to New York State, that's critical during this time of rollbacks. But then how do we lend what we learn to the broader advocacy nationwide? So that's the strategy, and that, that's what we're wrestling with. We know we are, I just don't want to say a progressive city, but we've done some remarkable work over the past uh, four or six years. We want to ensure that those are safe and cannot be unmoored. And then we want to make sure we offer our lessons learned to other localities. Director Ebanks, I again will say, as I think I said to you the first day we talked um, when you started this job, they are lucky to have you. you. Um, and I think um, they are lucky, lucky to have you. I think you are a thoughtful leader. Um, and somebody who will be talking about uh, critical issues with the administration. My concern 
is with the ability and the nimbleness mm -hmm. of the administration to hear and to act on the very important work that you're doing. And at a time when women are under attack, when minorities are under attack by the federal government, uh, my hope would be that the, uh, this administration would uh, be hungry for any opportunity to prove that New York City is the leader in these areas. And um, I, I say this out of frustration about the uh, Special Victims Division, uh, where you know the administration was gifted the opportunity to have a world-class Special Victims Division and, and be very proud about that work. Um, there was a real opportunity there that uh, was missed. Um, I, I um, am baffled by it. So um, it's, it's very much, I, I, again, I think the administration is very lucky to have you. Um, I'm going to go on to the Sex Health Education Task Force um, and am just uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the outcomes of uh, the task force, the findings, and, and the action plans. The, the task force uh, released its report in, in July and um, we are now looking at our second phase. I want to say uh, portions of our recommendations were, um, were included in the 24 Million Health Ed Works initiative. Yep. And the, we are about to reconvene the Sexual Health Education Task Force to look at those portions that were not. Okay. We are in uh, discussion with DOE, and they are strong partners in this work, uh, and uh, actually serve as vice chair for the task force as well. So beginning in the spring, we will reconvene the task force to look at next steps. Uh, as you know, the task force has a five-year lifespan, so four more years are remaining on this work. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Council member, do you have any additional questions? Well, again, I just want to reiterate that the administration has uh, made a great choice in having you be its executive director, and I know that you're going to lead them in um, helping them find their way to uh, address the issues of 51% of the population, um, in, in particular uh, women of color, um, who, as I say, you know, when we talk about the Special Victims Division and economic empowerment, which primarily affects mm -hmm. women of color, um, so far we, we, yeah. we have not been impressed. Um, so uh, I look forward to continuing our work together, and I thank you for your public service. Thank you so much. I just want to say that w we at the commission, the, uh, the staff, appreciate your partnership. We appreciate and value your leadership and that of uh, commission uh, city council member Ayala. Um, we take these words as motivation to really re-engage and to do a job deserving of the, uh, the public and New Yorkers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to call up the next panel. Um, thank you again for your time. This panel um, of experts are international and CEDAW-focused um, experts. Mary Luke um, from UN Women Metro New York. Sheila Katzman um, for, from New York City for CEDA, and also um, Howard Katzman from New York City for CEDA. Thank you.
Thank you, um, Mary. Yeah, please start. Mary, hang on one sec. Can you make sure the red light is on? Okay. Is it oh, on now? Oh, yeah. Very good. Sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much for having us here at this um, oversight hearing. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to really speak about the progress of CGE as well as some of the pending challenges. Um, I'm the executive director? No, I'm the president of the Metro New York chapter of uh, the U.S. National Committee for UN Women. And as a partner and a member of the steering committee of New York City for CEDAW Act, I want to recognize the achievements of CGE thus far, and especially uh, some of the uh, achievements that were already stated about the um, gender equity liaisons, the, uh, the fact that they published the leveling the pl paying field to draw attention to the best practices of gender pay equity, leadership on the sex education, e education task force. So all of these are really commendable and we're especially proud of their efforts towards the 16 days of activism, which is just about to start, but which the CGE has really uh, demonstrated leadership for over six months in gaining the attention and support of communities. So today's presentation, I really wanted to focus on CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Our goal is the same as CGEs, which is to ensure that women, especially marginalized women, will have access to gender-sensitive policies, programs, and services based on human rights principles. We recommend that New York City, with the leadership of CGE, incorporates CEDAW as a human rights framework uh, to prevent discrimination and ensure equal rights and opportunities for all women. CEDAW will help CGE achieve its strategic goals of economic empowerment, health and reproductive justice, and safety for all. And that is through access and participation, through money, and through power. The participation of women, LGBTQ, transgender, gender nonconforming, cisgender people is required in the planning and evaluation of all programs and policies. And the importance of sex and race disaggregated data has already been mentioned, but it's critical to understand the, uh, the population that we're trying to serve, especially marginalized populations. Uh, it's so important to have the civic engagement through a participatory gender budgeting process. Again, money is important. Money and how money is being spent and CEDAW framework would help to uh, ensure and review how money is allocated to all these marginalized populations. And I think the third point is about power. Women must have power and equal access to and representation in all levels uh, of management, as well as on boards and commissions. And in that way, women will be at the table and will be able to ensure that these policies and programs meet their needs. So as the mayor has stated on the release of a report to the UN on social goals, New York is on track to become one of the more equitable, healthier, and safer cities in the world. By having CEDAW formally as a fundamental framework, New York, our international city, and home to the United Nations, will establish itself as a premier city in the United States, which affirms that gender discrimination holds no place in New York City. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's morning still. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheila Katzman, and I'm the president of the International Association for Women in Radio and Television, the USA. I'm the chair for New York City for CEDAW Act. I want to thank you, the Committee on Women, um, for inviting New York City Vecido team here to participate. 
in this important hearing of the oversight of the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. I ditto all the accolades that um, Mary already put up on this, um, this commission. I am happy to read in the report published for this hearing of the tremendous amount of action taking place around gender equity, gender equity in the city. So much has been achieved and we want to really say how appreciative we are of the committee and of the CGE. I read with great interest the synopsis of the GCE 2018-21 strategic plan of September 2018. The three areas highlight, highlighted from the guiding principles, which includes the recognition of diversity of gender, ensuring the development and implementation of best practices, et cetera. I'm quoting from the, um, the report put out on the, um, on the, uh, for, this, for this hearing. Also, the intersection of race is critical because women of color may not have the same experiences as white women, which means this has to be worked out as DC works to define gender. And, and I just want to add that um, we just need to know how CGE um, intends to operationalize gender, given the fluidity of gender. CEDAW offers um, a human rights framework to institu institutionalize new ways of thinking across city government about equitable distribution of government resources, taking into account how gender identifies and I gender identities and expressions intersect with identities such as race, disability, immigration status, sexual orientation, and age. In our view, every city agency should have the capabilities to report disaggregated data about these findings. This proposal envisions extending permanent positions to exceed the current one-year commitment for gender equity liaisons in city agencies that will be accountable for targeted and ongoing gender analyses and associated efforts. On the matter of gender equity liaisons also um, and their responsibility to develop a definition for gender equity, developing goals and indicators of measuring gender equity in defining, collecting, and analyzing, etc. I would like to recommend they look to CEDAW articles and the general recommendations in the SDGs, that's the Sustainable Development Goals, and for the first time in the history of the city, all city departments are coming together with a common goal for a city of gender equity. I would like to recommend that the commission refers mm -hmm. to the exceptional work being done in the Global Vision Urban Department in the Mayor's Office on the SDGs that was shared at the German mission to the United Nations recently. CEDAW is an international human rights treaty that represents an international consensus on what constitutes discrimination against women. It was relevant when it was adopted at the UN in 1979 and it's even more relevant today with its numerous general recommendations keeping up with the times and the fluidity of gender. Um, while the United States has signed the CEDAW Treaty, it has not ratified it, making the US the only democracy not to do so. The first 17 articles of CEDAW, it's attached for your benefit, form a framework or gender lens through which government actions can be viewed. This initiative represents a belief in public participation as a vehicle for change. All analyses, whether it be gender or legal, must be available for public scrutiny, input, and feedback. Some of the questions I heard um, thrown at um, our executive director, and, um, and I, I must say that I appreciate the responses. There are many activities of the government of which members of the public, especially program recipients, have a unique perspective. There's also much expertise in the community to independently identify both problems and solutions. Implementation was mentioned twice on page six and nine of what was put out on legislator, 
Is that what it's called? Legis yeah, le 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 what, what, yeah, 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 legister, yeah. And that was very welcoming to see the word implementation. Because you don't often see that. Funds and resources will be needed to staff the implementing commission and training for agency staff to understand using a gender lens mm -hmm. and a human rights framework in assessing agencies' programs, budgets, and employment practices, report, writing, and publication. The rest of this is about my organization and, and what it is. We are, uh, um, do I have time? Yeah, okay, so uh, first of all, I want, to I want to borrow the quote from the First Lady cited in this committee's report of the meet this meeting. We, quote, we will accept nothing less than the full inclusion of women and girls of all ethnicities in our city, economically, socially, and politically. CEDAW right. has a very wide ambit, which includes guiding principles of basic fundamental rights of economic, social, political, cultural, and civic. My organization, the International Association of Women in Radio and Television, USA, is a chapter of the IWAR global organization formed by professional women working in electronic and, and uh, allied media with a mission to strengthen initiatives towards ensuring women's views and values are an integral part of programming and to advance the impact of women in media. We organize conferences, implement projects, undertake activities, and collaborate with media organizations. It is a non-governmental organization in consultative status with the uh, United Nations Economic and Social Council and is accredited to the UN Department of Public Information. I want USA is a 501c3 charitable organization that is managed by a board which oversees funding initiatives for member activities. Our vision is to provide opportunities, share strategies, and contribute to the development of women in broadcasting by sharing professional and technical knowledge in order to advance the impact of women in media and the rights of women in general. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. He, him, oh. he him, his, Chair Rosenthal, Council Member Ayala, I welcome the opportunity to testify to the committee on women on the oversight of the Commission of Gender Equity. My name is Howard Katzman, and I represent New York City for CEDAW Act, the coalition of over 300 community organizations advocating for an in initiative to incorporate a Women's Bill of Rights into New York City law. I've been a member of the steering committee since 2014, and I'm responsible for policy and strategy. Nationwide, we're part of an organization, Cities for CEDAW, which is advocating around the nation. We've been working with the Commission on Gender Equity since its formation in 2015, under the previous executive director and now with their successor. We believe the Commission on Gender Equity is an important component of our strategy for a New York City Women's Bill of Rights. The briefing paper for this hearing does a great service in outlining the history and attempts at achieving equity for women and girls of New York City. The Women's Commission has been a part of New York City government since 1975. The present administration has broadened the mandate to incorporate our greater recognition that gender is not just a binary and expanding women and girls to women, girls, transgender, and intersex residents. We also applaud the recognition of that other forms of discrimination layer upon gender discrimination as intersectionality. In my presentation, there are three years I would like to pursue. The first is defining a framework for a gender-based analysis of city agencies. Second, highlighting a procedure to facilitate analysis of agencies. And third, involving the, engaging the public for a more complete gender analysis. According to the briefing paper, the CGE, working with the Gender Equity Liaisons, GEL, are tasked with defining and developing a gender equity <coughs> framework in the work of city agencies. 
we advocate for basing the framework on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, the only human rights instrument that focuses on, <coughs> the only international film, international human rights instrument that focuses on women and in being drafted by, and in being ratified by 189 countries, represent an international consensus on the definition of gender equity. We recommend using the articles and general, recommendation, and general recommendations of CEDAW to develop a framework for a gender analysis of city agencies, <coughs> to be included in my colleagues' papers. This framework would help accomplish the three major tasks listed in the briefing. One, developing a definition of gender equity. Two, developing a set of goals and indicators for measurement. And three, gathering and analyzing the data. Doing a gender analysis would be too complicated for a centralized body not based within the city agencies. Instead, each agency could become responsible for their own gender analysis. They would use the ensuing framework and include the analysis when performing other project assessments. GELs would be trained to oversee the process, assisting their agencies in carrying out analysis. The public is important and should not be overlooked, but be involved in the process. Oftentimes, the perceptions of implementers of programs differ from those of recipients. The public will be able to point out any missing issues from the reports. To this end, we are advocating that the yearly reports be made, to the pub be made available to the public. The report could be available on the web. Community organizations can use it as outreach to their clients. Agencies could also distribute their section of the report to their clients and their workers. Responses from the public could be submitted to the CGE. We are grateful for the attention the New York City for CEDAW Act initiative has received from council members, particularly the chair of the Committee on Women and the Commission on Gender Equity, particularly the executive director. We look forward to an ongoing relationship. Thank you for this opportunity to submit our ideas. Okay, we're gonna take all of your ideas. Um, that was, no oh, quick question. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. We really learned quite a bit and we've been uh, whispering about a couple of them in particular. So thank you for your thoughtful testimony. Um, I'm wondering in particular about the city's, um, uh, the mayor's office on international relations. And I'm wondering if you've met with them, um, whether or not they've committed um, to the SDGs. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, at the initial stage, begin setup of the New York City for CEDO initiative, we were invited to brief the, the mayor's senior staff, legal staff, and the commissioners, head of departments, on, on what CEDO was and what it was about at that time. Um, we were instrumental, actually, in getting um, the first lady to UN Women, ending up in us having the safe city agreement signed and all of that, and the rest is history of what's going on. Yes, the international affairs sector and us, um, we did a lot of work with them initially, and I, th I think um, right now um, the SDGs is something that the mayor's office has yeah. taken on. I referred to, and I think it's Miss Inika of, the, um, of that department of global vision urban department, Jackie may know that about that than I do, um, gave a astounding presentation um, at, the, at the German mission three weeks ago at one of our events. And um, I was amazed at how she clustered the, uh, the, the SDGs ar across city departments and across mm -hmm. the things that are happening. So yes, because every country, every, it's unlike CEDA, every country, has signed on to um, to the SDGs. So this is very important. Did I answer your question? 
Well, please, Jackie. Sure, come on back. Is that all right? I'd like to add that the Mayor's Office of International Affairs, led by Commissioner Penny Abiwadina, uh, is the first, made New York City the first city to submit a local voluntary review within the SDGs. Right. So um, I think they're doing a phenomenal job, and they're a critical partner with us, CGE, in connecting us to the international space. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very helpful. Forget about that. But this is this mm. is just really great what's happening in the city at the time. I'm so elated. Really elated. And uh, great. We look forward to following up with you. Thank you all for your time. Really Thank appreciate you. Thank you. you. I'm going to call up the last panel. Um, oh, sure. Um, so we're going to hear from Sidra Sebastian from the Brotherhood Sister Soul and Crystal, Crystal Jennings Roger from the New York State uh, Nurses Association and also Elizabeth Cohn, if she could come up. Yeah, and uh, welcome back uh, to both of you. Um, Do you want to start? Beautiful. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for um, holding this morning's hearing. And so um, I'm glad to be here to speak on behalf of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. My name is Cedra Sebastian. The pronouns I use are she, her, and hers. We're a youth organization based in Harlem, New York, that works with young people of all genders throughout New York City. Um, as a Commission on Gender Equity is an advisory board that supports city agencies in dismantling institutional barriers for women and girls and New Yorkers of all gender identities and expressions. It's aligned with the recommendations that have come out of the Young Women's Initiative, which was already spoken about earlier today, but also the youth organizing efforts at the Brotherhood Sister Soul. For 20 years, BROSIS has provided long-term investment in girls and young women in Harlem and throughout the city. Our work with YWI was an opportunity to deepen that work on a city level and also create an opportunity for our youth members to have a direct impact in city engagement to ensure that girls are heard and centered in policy and funding decisions. Um, there were many key recommendations, including some of the ones that we heard of today, such as appointing gender equity liaisons to ensure that LGBTQ and trans and gender nonconforming inclusion at agencies were consistently keeping girls and young women and gender nonconforming youth at the center of policies coming out of the city. Um, there were also several recommendations related to cultural relevant and gender affirming curricula, as well as school climate. And the school climate piece is what has specifically brought me here today. Um, as we know from research by folks such as Dr. Monique Morris in the African American Policy Forum, black and Latina girls are more disproportionately disciplined, including suspensions and arrests than other groups of girls in schools. We also know that from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer's 2007 report entitled Who's Caring, where she looks at mental health care in New York City public schools, that it points, all the information points to better outcomes for students and teachers when there's greater access to mental health care providers on site. And yet, with this information, in Manhattan alone for school year 2016, there were approximately 177,000 students with only 221 school-based social workers in just 164 schools. That breaks down to roughly one social worker for every 800 students. That's a huge issue. And this is an issue that young people of our organization are addressing specifically our young women for our, our liberation program 
for youth activists and organizers who have personal accounts of what happens to them in schools when there are more security officers in NYPD than there are guidance counselors and therapists. They have shared their stories in many spaces, including most recently at NYCLU's Museum of Broken Windows in September of this year. For this reason, our youth members have launched an organizing campaign seeking the following demands to, be, um, to take place by 2020. An increase by 20% or more of student support staff, including guidance counselors, therapists, social workers, college and career advisors. Appropriate increase to New York City public school budget specifically for these positions. And a freeze on hiring additional school safety agency agents, basically security officers um, trained by NYPD or NYPD themselves. We believe that bringing these demands to fruition will greatly improve school climate and the total wellness of girls, as well as all students of New York City public schools. And we want to make sure that the New York City's City Council, Committee on Women, as well as the Commission is aware of the young people's work and this youth-led campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for your participation in all of these groups. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, the two largest groups of people living in poverty in this city are families headed by single parents. Oh, sorry. Could you um, just say your name I'm for sorry. the record? Certainly. Elizabeth Cohen. I'm a member of Voices of Women, of VOW. The two largest groups of people living in poverty in this city are families headed by single parents, followed by older women living alone. The impact of this is felt by society at large. Single women head the majority of households. They raise and support children and in many cases care for their aging parents. When women are not treated equitably, their families suffer as well, and society is deprived of their contributions. Yet as a woman, as a member of this group, my cultural training is to consider the needs of others first and put them ahead of my own needs. While I am glad the Commission has broadened the scope to be more inclusive, I feel it is important to make conscious this largely unspoken assumption and not lose sight of the fact that women comprise the, two, the largest two groups impacted by inequitable treatment. As Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, John, 150 years before women got the right to vote, quote, I long to hear that you have declared an independency, and that, by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to form in a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. The work of women is largely taken for granted and devalued. There is still the largely unspoken idea that a woman who is taking care of her children does not have a job and is not engaged in meaningful work. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the way Social Security treats divorced women in terms of retirement benefits and helps ensure that older divorced women who have been married for at least 10 years and probably worked as caregivers of their children get significantly less than their husbands and likely help explain why the second largest group living in poverty is older women. In effect, women who have worked at a wage-paying job and then worked at a non-wage-paying job with caring for children are penalized for it and worse off, especially in light of the fact that women earn less than men do on the dollar. Keep in mind that women as a group hold lower paying jobs than men and may not be able to afford to continue to work for pay because they cannot afford child care. The Social Security website says the following. If your ex-spouse is eligible for retirement benefits on their own re record, we will pay that amount first. If the benefit to you on your record is higher, they will get additional amount on your record so that the combination of benefits equals that higher amount. It is important to recognize that the additional amount on your record refers only to the years during which the couple was married. The husband gets the benefit of the wife's free child care and 100% of his earnings through the entire work history. The end result is older women who are poor. This is not the only way in which collaterally women are hurt by their invisibility and unspoken role as selfless supporters. Women who are mothers fall through the cracks in programs like the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption, or SCRE, 
program, and again in the Disability Rent Increase Exemption, or DREE program. Divorced and single women who are heads of households earn less than men and struggle to house and feed themselves and their children, but are not eligible to apply for the DREE program until they are 62 years old, although they may qualify financially for it. It would be beneficial to many women to lower the age requirement for eligibility substantially and would help them stay housed and make ends meet. Please keep in mind that women younger than 62 who are heads of households may be shouldering the burden of putting their children through school. The DREE program also only benefits households where the primary tenant is disabled, but not families which include a disabled child, as many women-headed households do. The eligibility for this program should include families that have a disabled member in them. There is also a need to provide training opportunities for women who are middle-aged and programs providing entry into good paying jobs. When women who have been single heads of households have raised their children, they become older women who need to provide for themselves. They are older and having given to others their skills and training need to be brought current to be able to find a job that pays well enough for them to live. Women who are middle-aged are often pressed with the needs of others and yet limited as to the opportunities for themselves. Employers often do not recognize that their life experience brings added value to their work. Colleges and training programs often see older women as a waste of their time because they have less time left to practice in the field. The reality is that middle-aged women have made some amazing contributions to society. We are old but not senior citizens and we need support to help us and our families survive economically and credit for the unpaid work we do. These are just a few examples of the ways in which programs designed to help unconsciously utilize criteria that make women who are heads of households and older middle-aged women ineligible for assistance, marginalizes them and puts them in poverty. Good morning, my name is Crystal Jennings Rogers. I'm going to be reading the testimony of Judith Cutchin, New York State Nurses Association President of Health and Hospitals Executive Council in Mayorals. New York State Nurses Association represents over 42,000 nurses working in the state of New York. We'd like to thank the committee and commission for taking time to hear testimony this morning. New York State nurses support the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, also known as New York City for CEDAW. CEDAW is an international treaty that defines various types of discrimination against girls and women and establishes guidelines governments can follow to end this discrimination. To date, 189 countries have ratified CEDAW, while 99 have signed. U.S. representatives at the U.N. have only signed CEDAW and the treaty has no binding effect on U.S. laws and policies. Cities for CEDAW is attempting to propel CEDAW compliance nationwide at the local levels. So far, nine cities have adopted the CEDAW framework and over 25 cities have passed resolution leading to full ordinance. CEDAW's core objective is to propel governments to eliminate all forms of discrimination against all women and girls in New York City. New York City for CEDAW proposes investigating city agencies to identify city laws and policies where discrimination against girls and women can be found, work with the public and government to perform community need assessments, and to create a plan of implementations and accountability to improve practices. Article 1 defines discrimination against women as any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of marital status on the basis of equality between men and women, of human rights, or fundamental freedom in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. Article 5 recognizes the role of culture and tradition and calls for the elimination of sex role stereotyping. Article 11 mandates the end of discrimination in the field of employment. Article 12 requires steps to eliminate discrimination from the field of health care, including access to family planning. These services must be free of charge. 
We believe implementing the CEDAW framework, we can improve individual and population health while advancing health equity. Including the New York City for CEDAW framework in the city's charter is the best way for New York City to demonstrate their commitment to eliminating discrimination against girls and women, adding transparency and compliance to existing non-discrimination laws, and helps New York take active steps toward preventing discrimination. Thank you to the committee and commission for considering this proposal and in incorporating a human rights framework in New York City's charter, guided by the principles of New York City for CEDAW. New York City can and should lead the country in declaring the end of discrimination against women and girls. Well, I want to thank you all for this very smart testimony. Um, I have one quick follow-up question, although, um, hang on. Uh, Elizabeth, I just want to say that um, I'm looking for a T-shirt that has <laughs> Abigail Adams' quote on it. That is wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm looking for a T-shirt. I mean, I will find myself a T-shirt. Just <laughs> <laughs> so to be very clear <laughs> about that. But, you know, really gives, gives your, your testimony is so thoughtful in that it gives us the historic perspective that women uh, are, are facing. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, Cedra, I just noted that uh, you were on the Young Women's Initiative and the, a member of the task force. And um, it is fantastic that we've moved forward with the gender equity liaisons. If you were looking down the list of sort of the next priority, what would it be in your mind's eye? And we can follow up on this off. The next After priority the for to as far as recommendations from yeah. YWI, I think the next major set of priorities to take a look at from YWI have to do around um, education as well as kind of the post secondary um, opportunities for girls and young women. And I'm saying girls and young women as a really bad shorthand for cisgender and transgender girls as well. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the recommendations that came out of the education, for example, didn't just address school climate, but also address curricula. So what are ways in which we're presenting curricula to young people, not just in a girl-specific class, but across DOE curricula, across the grades K through 12, that is culturally relevant and gender affirming? I think some folks have wrapped their minds around the culturally relevant part there's definitely work to do in that area, but not necessarily the gender affirming piece. And so I think that would be a next set of priorities. And also in the education space around the training that is done for um, educators and faculty in schools to address issues that come up with girls and gender nonconforming youth specifically. As far as um, issues that come up around um, not meeting the mark with Title IX, around dress codes that are often used as a way to have kind of um, anti-sexual harassment policies, but it's not an anti-sexual harassment policy. It's about penalizing young people because of their dress code, and that's not a way to, dis to um, diminish bullying or to address harassment that takes place in schools. Um, so ones that really get to that issue. And I think the other piece around post-secondary um, supports for young people kind of speaks to what you were talking about, right? So if we want to make sure that when young people become adults, they have all that they need to be productive in the city, we need to make sure that that's matching the education that they're getting in public schools as well as the opportunities that's leading out. So in addition to improvements to SYEP, I would also say that there needs to be improvements for opportunities for young adults between like 18 to 24 um, to continue to receive supports around developing unique skills so that they can be ready for the workforce and really be engaged mm -hmm. in whatever career that they choose, whether that's starting their own business or joining established companies. So for me, those two things would be mm -hmm. immediate priorities around education and then post-secondary opportunities for young people. What would be the measures of success? Um, I think before we get to that, there's a lot of data that folks don't have access to mm -hmm. to even get a full picture of what's happening now. So there's not 
data that you can easily pull out, for example, of the experiences of young people who are young people of color who identify as trans or gender nonconforming in schools. There's no data that you can pull out from that, right? They're either lumped together or not included at all. Yeah. Um, there's not a whole lot of clear data that really looks at the breakdown of disciplinary hearings or disciplinary actions. Yeah. Um, there's not a whole lot of data that you can clearly pull out around young people who have different Im immigration status. So that's another area where we will want to be able to pull out that data first before then drawing the line to like a measure of success. Um, but I think some of the key measures of success wouldn't just include graduation rates, but it would also include um, access that young people have to basically go into a city college and not have to take remedial classes. Mm -hmm. um, being able to get jobs out of graduation, um, whether that's with an associate's or other degrees, a way to track that information, I think could be some measures of success. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Um, I was smiling with the commissioner while you were talking because I know she's working on exactly that type of data collection and um, is, you're on the right track clearly. Um, does anyone else want to add to the notion of what would the measures of success be or, or data indicators we should be looking at? And you can also contact the committee afterwards, um, and that goes for everyone who's testi testified today. If there are other things we should be looking at or other measures of success, that would be very helpful. So thank you all. Um, I actually have one last person who's come in who I'd like to hear from, from the Black Women's Blueprint. Um, Sharia, oh, there you are. Hi, Sharia Tyndall Weisendanger. Weisendanger. Thank you. Thank you for coming today and um, coming to testify. Sure. I'm getting a feeling, looking at your phone, that you don't have written testimony. I do have written testimony. Will you uh, on your phone? But yeah. Right. <laughs> so will you um, please send it in after this hearing and so we can have it be part of the transcript? Sure. Great. Um, Thank you. Definitely. So uh, I'm here representing um, Black Women's Blueprint or BWB. Um, and uh, we're here because uh, I'm here because uh, the organization was uh, felt it was really important for um, our voice to be heard and our particularly our members voices um, via their own um, testimonies on their own, on their own um, experiences, traumatic experiences with gender-based violence. Um, I have a myriad of testimonies, and I will read just one of those. Um, I was sexually molested by my biological father for years. During family sleepovers and other vulnerable times, such as luring me to play video games with him, he would expose my bottom and rub his penis against me until he ejaculated. This continued in secret until my parents divorced when I was 11. His final attempt happened when I was 12, but by then I understood what he was doing and kicked him away from me. He never tried again, and to this day he denies his actions. I finally told my mother when I was 20 years old. Um, so, uh, just on behalf of BWB members and staff, uh, we feel it's really important, um, really to echo all the sentiments that were said today um, about the importance of CDOT and um, the initiatives that the city will take on to um, support survivors um, and to ensure that women, uh, women's stories end here, that there are no more testimonies to be given in this way. Thanks. Whoa, come oh, back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that was so powerful. I'm just speechless. Thank you for coming and testifying. Um, I agree with you 100%. I mean, I share your goal. My goal is to shut down the work of this committee so that in the next city council, there is no there committee is on women because yeah. men's behavior has changed. Um, I, I, I'd like to follow up with you. Um, about your testimony because what I'd ask you to think about is um, 
of course, I, we have our work with survivors, but also how do we get at prevention in the case that you just mentioned? How do we get at educating young girls as early as pre-K and K uh, about what they could notice uh, happening and, and the, the importance of reporting and the importance of a, a acknowledging, knowing that it really, that something violent is happening to them, it has nothing to do with them as a person. Um, and yet, you know, it changes people. Definitely. Um, I think the best um, person at BWB to meet with is Farrah Tanis. She's our ED. Okay. Um, uh, or Savannah Brown, who's our uh, associate ED. I just started on, um, like, the first, so I'm probably not the best person <laughs> to discuss that with. Um, but they are well-versed. They've been doing this work since 2008. Um, uh, this is very personal work for, for them, and so they're good at what they do, and they are the experts on, on this. So. And they clearly had good decision-making skills in hiring you. <laughs> well, thank you. So <laughs> thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to call the hearing to a close.